Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the ASHNR for giving me the opportunity to speak about sinonasal anatomy for today's webinar. I have two primary objectives for my talk today. By the end of the presentation, I'm hoping that you'll be able to identify the relevant anatomy of the sinonasal cavity and identify key anatomic variants. So the sinonasal cavity is lined by a respiratory pseudostratified epithelium, and that's made up of four different cell types. This mucosa attaches to bone and is referred to as the mucoperiosteum. The mucosa produces about a liter of mucus per day, and the function is to trap particles, and it's compromised when it's inflamed. Like we see in this example, here we can identify that there's thickening of the walls of the maxillary sinuses with opacification of the maxillary sinus in this patient with chronic sinusitis. So when we're evaluating a patient presenting with sinus symptoms, it's important for us to consider who's ordering the examination. Is the, is the patient presenting with acute symptoms or are they presenting with chronic symptoms? If they're pre presenting with acute sinusitis, we want to consider if they have any signs of complications related to their sinusitis. If they're presenting with chronic symptoms, we want to consider if they're a pre-surgical candidate. So when is it appropriate to image? Well, if a patient's presenting with symptoms of less than four weeks of duration with uncomplicated sinusitis, there's really no indication for imaging, as we know that sinusitis is a clinical diagnosis. We want to consider imaging patients presenting with acute symptoms, specifically if we're worried that the patient has complications related to their sinusitis. So is the patient presenting with symptoms related to diplopia? Uh, do they have additional uh, findings related to soft tissue swelling around their face or their orbits? Uh, or do they have uh, a headache that's out of proportion uh, to their sinus, sinus symptoms? And in these patients, we want to consider evaluating them with an MR or a CT with contrast. Most often, we're going to be evaluating patients presenting with chronic symptoms or acute uh, recurrent acute symptoms. And in these patients, we're going to be evaluating them uh, with a CT scan without contrast. And here we're going to be looking for anatomic compromise of the drainage pathway. So our standard protocol includes bone windows uh, in the axial, sagittal, and coronal plane. We also will do additional soft tissue windows in those three planes to evaluate for the sinus pathology, as well as to look for uh, a compromise of the drainage pathway. So our surgery colleagues will take a look at the sinus examinations prior to uh, functional endoscopic sinus surgery, and they're going to be looking uh, for a series of uh, findings. They want to evaluate the relationship of the uncinate to the, to the lamina papricia. They want us to uh, identify, is there any evidence of orbital dehiscence? The lawful take a look at the sagittal slope of the skull base. They'll look at the depth of the olfactory grooves, and they'll uh, ask us for help to look for surgical landmines, so looking for accessory cells, as well as they're going to be identifying the location of the anterior and posterior ethmoid arteries. So we typically will use a structured reporting style uh, when we're dictating uh, these sinus examinations. So we'll look at these uh, findings with a structured report, and we'll first identify, uh, has the patient has any prior surgery? We'll then take a look at the sinuses to evaluate the degree of mucosal thickening and whether there are air fluid levels. We'll take a look at the specific drainage pathways that drain each one of these sinuses, and we'll take a look at the nasal cavity and turbinates. We'll often then focus on the anatomic variants, looking at the teeth as well as corner shots. So looking at the anatomy of the nasal bones, we can identify that the nose is anchored superiorly by two paired nasal bones, and those anchor the cartilaginous external nose. The nasal bones are uh, attached to the rest of the facial skeleton laterally by the nasal maxillary suture and superiorly by the nasofrontal suture. So looking from below, we can identify uh, the external uh, uh, soft tissue portion of the nose, and that's referred to as the nasal ala. Within the midline, we have the columella, which is a soft tissue structure that divides the nostrils into two separate compartments. Those nostrils open up into the nasal cavity through a bony inlet referred to as the piriform aperture. That piriform aperture is found at the level of the frontal process of the maxilla. <laughs> 
posteriorly, we have the coena, and that's a space that separates the nasal cavity from the nasopharynx. And within the midline, we have the nasal septum. So now let's take a look at the nasal septum. So the nasal septum we know is made up of cartilage anteriorly and bone posteriorly. The superior part of the osseous nasal septum is made up of the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid, and inferiorly we can see the vomer, which attaches to the hard palate. So if we take a line just at the level of the Christigalli uh, and look at a coronal view, we can identify the nasal septum. So here we can see that perpendicular plate of the ethmoid superiorly and the vomer inferiorly. And we can see that that superior uh, configuration kind of continues on as the Christigalli. So the nasal septum attaches superiorly to the cribriform plate. And we know that the cribriform plate has, has two different components, the horizontal lamella and the vertical lamella. The vertical lamella then makes a right angle and uh, continues on uh, and attaches to uh, the roof of the ethmoid sinus or the fovea ethmoidalis. Now just in front of the Christigalli, we can see the foramen cecum, which is an important anatomic structure uh, to take a look at, particularly in patients that have craniofacial abnormalities. Cradled within the uh, cribriform plate is the olfactory fossa, which of course houses the olfactory bulb. Below the uh, cribriform plate, we have the olfactory recess or olfactory cleft, and that should be uh, filled with air. So here we've got our olfactory bulb, which has those little projections that communicate with the nasal cavity, which help, of course, to facilitate olfaction. So the olfactory fossa can, of course, be measured, and that uh, measurement we will measure from the horizontal lamella of the cribriform plate to the fovea ethmoidalis. And that's going to be described based on the Kiros classification. So if you have a relatively shallow olfactory fossa, that's a type 1. And a relatively deep olfactory fossa is a type 3. And a type 2 is in between. So in a patient presenting with a recurrent meningitis, we want to take a look at the sinonasal cavity to see if we can potentially identify a site of a meningocele or encephalocele. So if we see asymmetric opacification of the olfactory recess, we really want to be thinking about uh, an associated meningocele. So here in this case, in this patient that had a non-contrast head CT, we can see this asymmetric opacification. So this is definitely a red flag for us. And this patient wants to have a cisternogram, and we can see uh, that we've got asymmetric opacification of that olfactory recess with pooling of contrast and inferior displacement of the olfactory bulb. So we'll also want to take a look to see, is there any evidence of nasal septal deviation? Is this can potentially be a cause of uh, decreased smell? Um, so we'll take a look to see the degree of septal deviation uh, from the midline, and we'll also want to uh, describe if there's evidence of a septal spur and to see if that spur potentially contacts one of the middle turbinates or the wall of the nasal cavity. We'll often also see perforation within the nasal septum, and that can be uh, post-surgical or related to an underlying condition, uh, granulomatous disease, inhalation, uh, neoplasm, etc. So we'll describe the location and the size of the septal perforation. On either side of the nasal septum, we see three paired turbinates, and these help to filter the air that we breathe. So looking at our coronal view, we can see these three paired turbinates, which are the superior, middle, and inferior turbinate. And subjacent to the turbinates, we can see the uh, air spaces. And those are referred to as the superior, middle, and inferior meatus. The superior meatus, the middle meatus, and inferior meatus drain various structures uh, within the sinonasal cavity, and that we'll uh, take a look at next. The middle turbinate is the most complex of the three turbinates, and that has three sites of attachment. The superior attachment attaches to the junction between the uh, vertical and horizontal lamella of the cribriform plate. The horizontal limb of the middle turbinate swings laterally and attaches to the lamina papricia, uh, and we can see that that 
uh, basal lamella or ground lamella of the middle turbinate divides the ethmoid air cells into an anterior and posterior compartment. That posterior limb attaches to that uh, lateral wall of the nasal cavity on the posterior aspect of the maxillary sinus. So we know that the paranasal sinuses are a complex unit of four paired air-filled cavities at the entrance of the upper airway, and each is named after the skull bone in which it's located. So the maxillary sinus is the largest and most constant of the paranasal sinuses, and there are three uh, named recesses within the maxillary sinus. The alveolar recess, which is adjacent to the uh, maxillary alveolus, the zygomatic recess, which is uh, superior and lateral adjacent to the zygomatic bone, and the palatine recess, which is posterior. The ethmoid air cells are the most compartmentalized of the sinuses, and they are divided into the anterior and posterior ethmoid by the ground lamella or the basal lamella of the middle turbinate. And the lateral border we know is the lamina propitia, and that's that paper-thin bin bone that separates the ethmoid sinus from the orbits. The frontal sinus is located, of course, within the frontal bone, and it's divided into uh, two separate compartments by the intersinus septum, and they typically uh, develop asymmetrically. We know that the frontal sinus is the posterior border of the anterior cranial fossa, and the inferior border is the orbital roof. The sphenoid sinus is the most posterior of the sinuses, and that's located at the skull base at the junction between the anterior and middle cranial fossa. These sinuses often develop asymmetrically as well. The roof is the planum sphenoidale, and the posterior border is the cella turcica. Oftentimes prior to uh, skull base surgery, it's important for us to recognize the degree of pneumatization of the sphenoid sinus, particularly in patients that are uh, being evaluated for a transphenoidal surgical resection of an adenoma. So the pneumatization has been described uh, by this terminology uh, as published in radiographics. So the conchal type is no pneumatization of the sphenoid sinus, so you can see this dense bone of the clivus. We can also see this precellar type, which is pneumatization of the sphenoid sinus that stops just in front of the cella. The cellar type is complete pneumatization of the sphenoid sinus, and that wraps around the cella turcica. So now let's move on to the drainage pathways. So the osteomyoidal unit is a common drainage pathway that drains the maxillary sinus, the frontal sinus, and the anterior ethmoid air cells. So the natural uh, cilia within the maxillary sinuses are going to uh, beat towards the natural osteum of that maxillary sinus. That osteum is then going to open up into uh, what's called the infundibulum, which is, looks kind of like a chimney, a lateral to the uncinate process. So oftentimes, if patients have uh, abnormal drainage of the maxillary sinus, it's typically related to an abnormal uncinate process or a compromise of the drainage pathway at this level. So for the surgeons, when they're uh, wanting to open up that drainage pathway, they'll typically take down the uncinate process and create an uncinectomy. This infundibulum will then wrap around that free margin of the uncinate process, which is the hiatus semilunaris. And the frontal sinus and anterior ethmoid air cells will then drain into that hiatus semilunaris, and then ultimately those will drain into the middle meatus. The frontal sinus drainage pathway is the frontal recess, and that drains over the agronazi cell and directly into the hiatus semilunaris. The sphenoethmoidal uh, recess drains the sphenoid osteum and the posterior ethmoid air cells, and those drain ultimately into the superior meatus. So now let's take a look at some uh, uh, typical anatomic variants and surgical considerations. It's not uncommon for us to see pneumatization of a number of structures within the sinonasal cavity. It's important for us to comment on them, particularly in those pre-surgical patients, and especially if those are causing anatomic compromise. So in this patient that has pneumatization of the middle turbinates, those are referred to as concha bullosa. Here we have concha lamella, which is pneumatization of the vertical lamella of the middle turbinates. In this example, we can see pneumatization of the uncinate bone. Here we have pneumatization of the cristigalli. This is pneumatization of the lacrimal bone, or the agronazi cell, and that's that most anterior pneumatized air cell that we'll often see in our routine sinus examinations.
And it's important to comment on them, uh, particularly if they're co causing compromise of that frontal sinus drainage pathway. We'll often see additional air cells above or adjacent to the agronazi cell, and those are referred to as frontal and fundibular cells, and they are uh, termed uh, type 1 through type 4. So they're described in relation to the agronazi cell. So we first can identify the agronazi cell here, and if you have one cell above the agronazi cell, that's a type 1 frontal and fundibular cell, as we see in this pink example. If you have two air cells above the agronazi cell, those are type 2 frontal and fundibular cells. Here we can see a large air cell that spans both the ethmoid sinus and extends into the frontal sinus, and that's a type 3 frontal and fundibular cell. In this uh, coronal example, we can see that we have an isolated air cell within the frontal sinus, or a type 4 frontal and fundibular cell. We'll often see infraorbital air cells, and those are referred to as Haller cells, uh, and it's important to comment on those, particularly if they cause compromise of the osteomedial unit. We'll often also see large ethmoid bullar cells. Again, we'll want to comment on those, particularly if they're causing compromise of that osteomedial unit, like we see in this example. Here we can see near-complete uh, horizontal orientation of the uncinate and the infundibulum. This particular air cell is an important one to recognize. So we can see this uh, posterior ethmoid air cell that extends above the sphenoid sinus. This is the sphenoethmoidal air cell, or the onodi cell. And this is important uh, to identify for our surgical colleagues and as a surgical uh, potential landmine. We'll also comment on if there's pneumatization of the clinoid process or the optic strut. Here we have pneumatization of the pterygoid recess, which ends up being important, particularly if we're trying to evaluate uh, for a potential uh, site of a CSF leak or meningocele or encephalocele. Oftentimes the bone covering a pneumatized pterygoid recess is uh, very thin, and this is a common site for a CSF leak. We'll want to take a look at the posterior attachment of the intrasinus septum within the sphenoid sinus, particularly in, a, in those patients that are being evaluated prior to transphenoidal uh, surgery. So here in this example, we can see that that posterior attachment uh, attaches to the carotid canal. Lamina propitia dehiscence is one that our surgeons will definitely want uh, to be alerted uh, because if you have lamina propitia dehiscence, the surgeons can potentially enter into the orbit inadvertently. So this is one that we definitely want to include in the impression of our reports. So now moving on to teeth and cor corner shots. So it's not uncommon for patients that have synonasal uh, mucosal thickening for that to be uh, originating from the teeth. So especially if we have a patient presenting with recurrent symptoms, we want to take a look uh, at the adjacent teeth to look for an underlying or associated periapical abscess, like we see in this example. So in patients presenting with uh, sinus symptoms, we want to take a look at the adjacent soft tissues, and that's what our soft tissue windows are going to be helpful for. So in this young patient, uh, on the bone windows, we can see that there's complete opacification of that right maxillary sinus. On our soft tissue windows, we can also see that complete opacification. So on our soft tissue windows, we can we'll want to focus on the retroantral fat, the premalar fat, the brain, and the orbits. So here in this example, we can see that there's this subtle infiltration of that retroantral fat pad. Looking above the cribriform plate, we can see this focal area of low attenuation or edema uh, within that inferior aspect of the frontal bone or frontal lobe. So we're concerned that there's been spread of infection beyond the margins of the paranasal sinuses. We take a look a little bit further and we can see the small focus of gas, confirming our suspicion that there is extension of infection intracranially. So in this transplant patient, we have to have a high index, index of suspicion for looking for uh, pathology. So here on our bone windows, we can see some mild mucosal thickening within the ethmoid air cells. We also can see this focal area of dehiscence along the posterior lateral margin of the sphenoid sinus. On our soft tissue windows, we can see that there's this focal opacification at the level of the orbital apex. 
Now in this transplant patient, we have to be uh, really worried about invasive fungal sinusitis, even though there's not much mucosal thickening within the adjacent paranasal sinuses. We can identify on this MR examination this abnormal enhancement within the orbital apex, and this patient had a confirmed diagnosis of invasive fungal sinusitis. So it's not uncommon for us to see uh, uh, unexpected um, incidental findings on our sinus examinations. So here in this example, uh, we can see that there's this focal outpouching of the right middle cerebral artery on this non-contrast examination that was confirmed to represent an aneurysm on angiography. In this middle example, we can see that there's a calcified mass within the um, uh, lateral ventricles that was confirmed uh, to represent uh, an intraventricular tumor. And we also uh, get a good look at the cella on every examination that we do. And here we can see that there's expansion of the cella with an underlying soft tissue uh, mass within the, the pituitary gland. This was confirmed to represent an adenoma. So when we're evaluating a patient presenting with sinus symptoms, it's really important to go through a checklist approach. We're going to evaluate for surgical change, look at the sinuses, and evaluate for the degree of mucosal thickening. We'll want to take a look at the drainage pathways and comment on areas of anatomic compromise. We'll take a look at the nasal cavity, the turbinates, and the uh, nasal septum, and we'll really want to focus on calling out anatomic variants and surgical landmines for our surgical colleagues. We'll take a look at the uh, teeth and the corner shots. Thank you so much for your attention, and I appreciate the invitation. Hi. My name is Debbie Schatzkes. I'm a head and neck radiologist from Lenox Hill Hospital in New York City. I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you today about differential diagnosis of sinonasal masses. I'd like to thank my good friend Christine Glastonbury for inviting me to give this talk and for organizing this webinar series. Uh, I'd also like to thank the people who have supported this series, both at the ASHNR and in particular Nick Kuntz, uh, and at the ASNR. So I consider myself late career, and I think that gives me kind of certain dispensation to have little eccentricities, and I'm going to share one of them with you, um, and that is the fact that I sometimes have conversations with images. Um, usually they're in my head and under my breath, but occasionally some dialogue will escape. And then of course, there's a lot of puzzle trainees and colleagues around listening to me talk to myself. But this is the kind of way these conversations sometimes go. So I might see an image in a patient with a left nasal mass, and I might actually greet that image and say, you know, hey, tell me a little bit about yourself. I see that you are an expansile mass in the left nasal cavity, but, but you know, what else do you have to share with me that will help me make a differential diagnosis? And sometimes the mass will, you know, talk back to me and say, well, you know, I am expansile and I haven't destroyed, you know, much bone at all. And of course, I will find that, you know, pretty heartening, um, sounds like something benign. And I may say, well, cool, you know, and I'll keep looking at the film. And because I am a trained radiologist and I try to avoid satisfaction of search, I may actually identify something else important on the scan. And in this case, uh, another mass in the right nasal cavity. So in that case, um, I'm thinking, well, we've got multiple masses here. So maybe left nasal mass, you're really just a polyp. You know, you're a big expansile polyp. You know, that sounds great. Multiple masses, one dominant one. I think I've, I'm done and I'm just about ready to sign the case off. And if I'm lucky, the mass will then speak to me again and say, you know, hey there, not so fast, don't get carried away. You really need to look very carefully at the rest of the images and get a load of this image. 
and the mass may say, see this skull base defect? Pointing to a defect in the left ethmoid roof. I'm actually a cephalocele. I will breathe a big sigh of relief. Almost went down the tubes with that one. Thank you, Mass, for talking to me and keeping me out of trouble. So I, I'm not completely crazy, and I know that that conversation is happening in you know an alternate universe with rainbows and uh, unicorns and talking masses. And in the real world, there's no such thing to kind of help me along. So um, I try to remember that there um, is some bad news and some good news about imaging sinonasal masses. And I always like to start with the bad news, um, which is that there is a really broad differential diagnosis for sinonasal masses in all sorts of different categories of disease uh, and all sorts of different diagnoses. But the good news is that the vast majority of these are just going to be inflammatory polyps. So over three quarters of sinonasal masses, or close to three quarters, um, are actually polyps. Um, there is more bad news, which is that once we encounter an aggressive looking mass, there really are very few distinguishing features that help us make a specific diagnosis. Most malignant tumors really do look alike. But the good news is that malignant tumors are in fact very rare, and when we do encounter them, most of them, more than half, are gonna be squamous cell carcinoma. And we'll finish up with some good news, which is that our role in the management of patients with sinonasal tumors is really not so much to make the specific diagnosis. There are pathologists that can do that, um, but it's more has to do with tumor mapping, both within the sinonasal cavity, distinguishing tumors from trap secretions, but importantly, looking for tumor extent outside of the sinonasal cavity to the facial soft tissues orbit, and importantly, um, through the skull base. And as we saw, it's really important to check the skull base for masses going in like cephalocele's, but even more commonly masses going out like aggressive sinonasal tumors. So this is the scheme that I use when I think about sinonasal masses. And my first distinction will be between non-neoplastic and neoplastic disease. And within the non-neoplastic category, there are both inflammatory and non-inflammatory lesions. And in the neoplastic category, there are both benign and malignant lesions. And we're gonna look at some of the more common from each of these categories. We're gonna start with the inflammatory non-neoplastic category. And within that, we'll look at polyps, mucociles, mycetomas, and an interesting entity called rhea. So we already talked a bit about polyps. They are extremely common, representing the majority of cytonasal masses. They're indistinguishable on imaging from retention cysts. So these are a reaction to allergens, to inflammation. They often occur in patients who have had uh, repeated bouts of rhinitis, and they just really represent heaped up mucosa um, with water-like substance beneath them. Um, so they will image a lot like water on MR imaging. They are more commonly multiple than single, and if you do see multiple sinonasal masses, in the vast majority of cases, you're gonna be dealing with polyposis. Now, there are some variants, uh, and a common one that we may see is the anthrocoanal polyp. This is the same exact histology as uh, any other inflammatory polyp, uh, non-neoplastic, but it is distinguished by its location, starting in the maxillary antrum, and then prolapsing through either the osteomedial unit or through the nasal fontanelle or accessory maxillary osteum, as in the image on your right, into the nasal cavity. And from there, it may continue to prolapse posteriorly into the nasopharynx. And in that case, it's correctly called an anthrocoanal polyp. However, if it never makes it through the coena, it's probably should more accurately be called an antral-based polyp. And that's the term that I prefer to use for these lesions. So another non-neoplastic inflammatory lesion that may present as a sinonasal mass is a mucosil. And this is just a chronically obstructed sinus or air cell. We need two features to be present to diagnose a mucosil. The cell has to be completely opacified, 
but importantly also it needs to be expanded and the expansion can be dramatic as in uh, this case of frontoethmoidal mucosal um, on CT you may see only a thin or even absent cortical rim and on MR the imaging characteristics can be very unusual because the uh, contents can become inspissated with high protein content, giving you high T1 signal, dark T2 signal, um, really can be very odd looking on MR imaging. Um, but these are, you know, not uncommon mass-like manifestations of chronic inflammatory disease in the sinonasal cavity. Um, so another inflammatory process that can be mass-like in appearance is the mycetoma. And this is just uh, a form of non-invasive allergic fungal sinusitis that is localized. So this will be confined to a single sinus or maybe in involving contiguous sinuses. The key feature um, in these often expansile and very mass-like lesions is the presence of central high attenuation and sometimes calcification. Now these can grow very big and they can be associated with a lot of bone erosion. So the image on your right was a case that I did go down the tubes on. I was very impressed with the degree of what looked to me like aggressive destruction of the ethmoid complex the skull base, even the nasal septum, but I should have lent a little more importance to the central high density and calcified contents because this ultimately was just another mycetoma. The next in our list of non-neoplastic inflammatory lesions that may present with a mass-like appearance is an interesting entity called respiratory epithelial adenomatoid hamartoma, conveniently abbreviated as RIA. Um, and this is a newly reported entity that just recently became part of the WHO's classification of sinonasal lesions in its fourth edition published in 2017. So this is felt to be a reactive lesion to inflammation in the sinonasal cavity and as such it often occurs coincidentally with sinonasal polyposis. It occurs most commonly in the superior nasal cavity. It's often bilateral and is often associated with mild expansion of the olfactory recess. If you look at sagittal images, it often has this interesting sort of discoid appearance um, and that is helpful for making this diagnosis. Um, this is the kind of lesion, if you are gonna include it in your differential, um, when you are reporting a study, you may just wanna put in a word about what it is, um, that it is not neoplastic, that it is likely a reactive phenomenon because it is, you know, as yet kind of unfamiliar to a lot of our referring clinicians. All right, we're gonna move to another arm of our non-neoplastic category, um, and that is the non-inflammatory non-neoplastic lesions. And I have a little mnemonic that helps remind me to consider these lesions. Um, it is not correctly spelled, but I think of COFF, C-O-F-F, to remind me to think about cephalocele's, odontogenic masses, fibrous dysplasia, and flaps. So let's take a look at these lesions. All right, we already saw a cephalocele uh, at the beginning of the talk. Um, these represent herniation of intracranial contents through a skull-based defect. They may be acquired often post-traumatic um, or iatrogenic following uh, sinonasal surgery, or they may be congenital in etiology, but in each case there is some component of the intracranial compartment that has herniated through a skull-based defect uh, at presenting as a sinonasal mass. We don't necessarily do MR to make the diagnosis, but to characterize what specifically those contents are. So um, clinicians want to know whether this is just going to be meninges and maybe CSF or whether there's actually brain herniating through as in the image on your right. So you may often see this interesting pattern of these aberrant looking sulci kind of radiating from a little waste which represents the site where the brain has herniated through the skull base into the sinonasal cavity. So again, this reminds us that we have to be really vigilant about checking that skull base um, with any sinonasal mass, 
um, because things can move in both directions. All right, so the second in our cough differential of non-inflammatory non-neoplastic lesions um, is the odontogenic lesion. And of course, this will be found most commonly in the maxillary sinus because it's the sinus that borders the maxillary alveolar ridge. There are a few clues that you may be dealing with an odontogenic lesion, um, and one of them is pointed out by the red arrow. So you can see that there are two lines, kind of a double line appearance. The more superior one is the orbital floor, and the more inferior one is the roof of this mass. And that is a clue that there is something in that sinus that has originated from the alveolar, ri alveolar ridge. And if you think about it, the sinus itself is only that little black slit-like area. And in fact, the sinus is clear. There's nothing in the sinus. This is just the sinus floor being pushed superiorly um, by this alveolar ridge origin cyst. And this is a dentigerous cyst. And of course, if you do have a tooth crown in it, that's another really great clue to make you think about odontogenic origin of a sinonasal mass. Now, the third item in our cough differential is fibrous dysplasia. So we see this all throughout the body. It does like the craniofacial region. We tend to be most familiar with the ground glass appearance um, on CT, but remember this only occurs in about 50% of cases. Um, other times, these lesions may be cystic or sclerotic or very often a combination of both. And the MR features are even more confusing because despite the fact that this is just a tumefactive bone dysplasia and not actually a neoplasm, these can appear very mass-like they can enhance, um, but a clue on MR is the fact that um, there is very dark T2 signal and anything with the word fibrous in front of it or the word fibrosseous is gonna typically give you very low T2 signal. And that's in contradistinction to anything with the word chondroid in front of it, which typically is gonna give you very bright T2 signal. So, the final component of our cough differential for non-neoplastic, non-inflammatory lesions in the sinonasal cavity that may present with a mass-like appearance is the flap. And in the sinonasal cavity, the most common flap is the temporalis myofascial rotational flap. So what happens here is that the temporalis muscle and associated fascia is rotated down from its native location in the temporal fossa into typically a maxillectomy defect. And as such, there can be fairly bulky soft tissue in the maxillary sinus that may resemble recurrent or new tumor, particularly if there is no history or if there are no prior imaging studies. So clues to the diagnosis is the presence of fatty striations within this soft tissue, uh, representing fat within the muscle bundles, but also the appearance, and this is most common on coronal imaging, such as the image to your right, it's the appearance that this has originated from outside of the sinonasal cavity. So it looks like that flap is being uh, rotated in from the outside into that maxillary sinus, as of course it actually has. So another clue is to look at the donor site. And you may see absence of the normal temporalis muscle, but in some cases, there may actually be an implant in that temporal fossa. And this is to maintain cosmesis so that uh, the patient doesn't have the appearance of severe temporal wasting. Okay, at this point, we're going to move to the neoplastic side of our sinonasal mass differential. And we're gonna look at both benign and malignant sinonasal tumors. But first, let's take a minute to review the WHO's classification of sinonasal lesions. And this is now in its fourth edition, uh, published relatively recently in 2017. And this represents a very abbreviated list just to give an idea of the major categories. So the categories in this classification include carcinomas, and we've already mentioned how squamous cell carcinoma is the most common, 
papillomas, which are benign epithelial neoplasms, salivary gland tumors, which are not unexpected in this region, given that there are submucosal minor salivary glands in the sinonasal cavity, just as they are present in the upper air digestive tract. Now there are benign, malignant, and borderline soft tissue tumors. There are hematolymphoid tumors, most commonly lymphoma. There's the interesting category of neuroectodermal tumors, most famously esthesioneuroblastoma in this region. And then kind of a wastebasket categories of other tumors, including meningioma. We'll start with the benign entities. Um, and some of the more common ones that we will see are papillomas, meningiomas, the fibroosseous tumors, and uh, benign soft tissue tumors. So the papilloma um, is a benign epithelial neoplasm as opposed to a polyp, which is not neoplastic at all. And one variety that occurs commonly in the sinonasal cavity is the inverted papilloma. And when that occurs, there are actually some fairly characteristic imaging appearances. And most famously, there is this cerebriform or convoluted morphology to the inverted papilloma. This will be most obvious on uh, T2 or as in the image on your left, enhanced T1 images, where you really see this kind of interesting gyral morphology, often kind of radiating out from a central pedicle. Now, these tumors attach to the sinonasal wall at a pedicle where there often is the formation of focal hyperostosis or a, a frank osseous strut that you may see. And that is seen most easily on CT imaging. And we really want to look hard for this pedicle because while these tumors are benign, they need to be completely resected because they may harbor or degenerate into squamous cell carcinoma, and they may recur, particularly if that pedicle is not resected. So we want to scrutinize our images for the presence of this little hyperostosis or osseous strut reflecting that site of origin and include that in our report. So meningiomas occur obviously intracranially at the skull base, but 2% of meningiomas are actually extracranial. And we see these in the orbit, the sinuses, the mastoids, and even in the nasopharynx. When these occur in the sinonasal cavity, they tend to occur near the skull base. So we're gonna see them um, typically near the anterior skull base in the nasoethmoidal region. And they will image like meningiomas everywhere else with enhancement and sort of moderate T2 hyperintensity reflecting fairly cellular content. But most characteristic is when you see hyperostosis. So just like with meningiomas elsewhere, these may incite sclerosis and overgrowth of adjacent bone as we see on the coronal image uh, on the left, the CT image, the ethmoid roof, the, the uh, um, Krista Galli and the nasal septum are all markedly hyperostotic, a really good clue that we are dealing with a sinonasal meningioma. Now, osteoma is actually the most common sinonasal tumor overall, and we know that we encounter these frequently as incidental findings on, you know, sinonasal scanning for inflammatory disease or for trauma. Um, and mostly when they're small, they're clinically insignificant. Um, they become important when they obstruct drainage pathways. So if we look at the CT image on the left, we can see that the right nasal cavity osteoma is obstructing both the frontal sinus outflow tract and the osteomedial unit. But what's interesting about this lesion is it illustrates that not every osteoma is going to give you that classic ivory appearance that we see on the inferior aspect of that mass marked by the red arrow. In many cases, there will be lesser degrees of mineralization, um, and we may see, you know, something other than that ivory appearance. And this gets even weirder when we look at MR. So if we look at the middle image, contrast enhanced, and the image on the right, coronal T2, we can see that the really dense ivory component is giving us a complete signal void. And if we didn't have the CT, we may not even know that it's there. We might infer that there's something there based on the fact that that airway space is kind of expanded. 
Um, but look at that less ossified component. We actually see enhancement. This is a tumor um, and it will enhance. And note that we do see um, low T2 signal, you know, even in that uh, not ivory component, because again, anything that starts with fibro or osseous is gonna be expected to give us that relatively low T2 signal. So in the category of benign soft tissue tumors, we may see juvenile angiofibroma, and this is a lesion with characteristic imaging appearance and demographics. So these occur almost exclusively in adolescent males. They are very hypervascular tumors, so these uh, tumors often present with uh, epistaxis as well as nasal obstruction. We're gonna expect to see avid enhancement. And on MR, we expect to see vascular flow voids within this lesion. What is also characteristic is its site of origin because these almost always originate from the, the region of the sphenopalatine foramen, which is marked by the red arrow. This is the medial aspect of the pterygopalatine fossa where it communicates with the nasal cavity. And since these lesions arise characteristically in this location, they often grow in each direction from there. So laterally into the pterygopalatine fossa, classically expanding it, potentially growing through the lateral egress of the pterygopalatine fossa into the infratemporal fossa, but they will also grow medially um, and either grow posteriorly to the nasopharynx or anteriorly to the nasal cavity or both. Now, any lesion can grow in any one of these directions or all of these directions. Um, so we see entirely nasal cavity tumors, but we also see ones that are have a very small nasal cavity component as well. Although these are benign, they can be locally aggressive, and when they invade the skull base, curative surgery may be very, very difficult um, with uh, the need for uh, post-op radiation, which is something we hate to do in skeletally immature patients, but may be necessary because of the invasive features of these um, benign tumors. All right, so now we're gonna to move to our final category, and that is the malignant arm of the neoplastic sinonasal masses. So we've already talked about how squamous cell carcinoma is the most common sinonasal malignancy, representing more than half. Um, these love to occur in the maxillary sinus, but they can occur throughout the sinonasal cavity, including in the nasal cavity. And there are no specific imaging features. They just look like aggressive masses with an aggressive pattern of bone destruction. No expansion here, no thin eggshell cortex, just blasted through as the image on the left demonstrates. Heterogeneous enhancement, heterogeneous T2 signal, but a strong propensity to grow out of the sinonasal cavity into the adjacent soft tissues and also a propensity for perineural tumor spread, most commonly on the maxillary nerve, as well as lymphadenopathy, which we tend to not think of so much um, with sinonasal tumors, but does occur fairly commonly. We gotta look at the margins of our uh, images to look for retropharyngeal and uh, upper cervical lymphadenopathy that we may see on those images. Another ca carcinoma that is definitely less common, um, but on occasion has some characteristic imaging features is the adenocarcinoma. So this is a very diverse group of carcinomas with many variants. Um, there are salivary and intestinal subtypes, and because of that, the imaging characteristics are variable. But sometimes adenocarcinomas um, will have a predilection for the ethmoid sinuses, and they may give you bright T2 signal, as we see on the middle image, that is significantly higher than a squamous cell carcinoma. So both the ethmoid location and that bright T2 signal would cause me to put squamous cell carcinoma lower on this list and might have me put uh, adenocarcinoma at the top of my differential. Again, remembering that our job is not really to make that specific histologic diagnosis. A subtype of adenocarcinoma is adenoid cystic carcinoma. This is a salivary form of adenocarcinoma. The characteristic feature here is the presence of early and extensive perineural tumor spread as we see in the parotid gland or any of the major salivary glands, um, these tumors love 
to hop on to nearby cranial nerves. Um, in the case of a maxillary sinus tumor, this would tend to be the maxillary nerve, but when these tumors grow posteriorly into the masticator space, as we can see on the right image, these can also jump onto V3, and as we see, it's going up foramen ovale towards Meckel's cave, and in the middle image, we see both foramen rotundum involved superiorly and the Vidian canal infero medially highly neurophilic tumor. On the basis of just the aggressive maxillary tumor on the left hand image, we would just say squamous cell carcinoma is most likely. So in our neuroectodermal category, the most common lesion we see in the sinonasal region is the esthesioneuroblastoma. These tend to arise from the olfactory epithelium in the superior nasal cavity. So transcranial extension through the skull base happens often and early. And when the tumor encounters the brain, it often forms these marginal cysts. That is characteristic, but it is not pathognomonic of esthesioneuroblastomas because it has been described in other lesions as well. So neuroectodermal tumors have somatostatin receptors. And because of that, uh, somatostatin analog imaging can be used um, in the assessment of these tumors. And this goes for neuroectodermal tumors in other locations, including carcinoid tumors, pancreatic islet cell tumors, medullary thyroid tumors. All of them have somatostatin receptors and somatostatin analog imaging, such as a triotide or as on the image on your right, dotatate can be used to evaluate these patients. Now, there's no need to do that to make the diagnosis of the primary tumor because that is a biopsy diagnosis, but we do use this to look for recurrence um, in the surgical bed post-op and also to look for uh, intracranial dural metastases, uh, lymph node metastases, and distant metastases, which do occur in the setting of this uh, tumor. And I think we're previously very much undiagnosed before we had the ability to use these radionuclide scans, um, which are highly sensitive for these deposits. Another neuroectodermal tumor that we may see in the sinonasal cavity is the mucosal melanoma. And these are uh, really dismal tumors with terrible prognosis. Um, when they are amelanotic, when they are, they are that amelanotic subtype, there are no specific imaging features. But if we look at the images uh, that Rick Harnsberger kindly lent me, we can see that on the left, we've got a T1 enhanced image and we see that there is a clearly aggressive looking maxillary sinus tumor. It has grown outside the sinus into the premaxillary retroantral soft tissues. First thought should be squamous cell carcinoma. We move to the middle image, the coronal stir. Um, and while squamous cell may have some sort of heterogeneous and sometimes somewhat low signal, this is lower than expected. But the real clue uh, is on the image to your right, which is the C minus uh, T1 image. And we can see that there is T1 shortening. There is T1 hyperintensity, even in the absence of contrast. And this is a melanotic subtype of mucosal melanoma occurring in the sinonasal cavity, reminding us that we do really need to um, always look at those pre-contrast T1 weighted imaging for a variety of different clues. All right, so hematolymphoid tumors occur throughout the body. We are very familiar with intracranial lymphoma. Lymphoma are along the skull base is common, and we do see it in the sinonasal cavity. It images like lymphoma everywhere else, homogeneous, moderate enhancement, homogeneous, only moderate T2 hyperintensity. These are small, round blue cell tumors, um, tightly packed, big um, nuclei, not a lot of water diffusion restriction. And these can sometimes be a little tricky because initially, as we see in this left nasal cavity mass, we may think that this is just a lobular expansile looking lesion. Um, but we need to look carefully and that the red arrow is pointing to creepy, crawly, invasive extension of this tumor along the uh, roof of the left maxillary antrum. We need to also look carefully at the skull base. Um, these tumors can grow through skull base foramina as well. Um, so, you know, can be 
tricky, um, really have to interrogate the films for uh, signs that this is not just some benign, lobular looking uh, mass. In the category of malignant soft tissue tumors, uh, we can encounter chondrosarcomas in the sinonasal cavity, just like in the skull base and throughout the body. Again, when there is a prefix of chondroid, we expect to see high T2 signal like we see on the coronal T2 image on your right. These tend to occur along the nasal septum, the septum, of course, having a cartilaginous component. Um, so they do present most commonly as midline or bilateral nasal cavity masses. If you do do CT imaging, you may be able to see that characteristic chondroid matrix of arcs and rings within these lesions as well. So that concludes our whirlwind tour through differential diagnosis of sinonasal masses. And if I can bring you back for a moment to the world of rainbows and unicorns and talking images, um, I'm not endorsing that you converse with your images on a regular basis, but just suggesting that, you know, if you are looking at a, a mass in the sinonasal cavity and it's quiet in your reading room, you might listen for a little voice that will just remind you um, that there is a pretty broad differential diagnosis for sinonasal masses that includes the neoplastic and non-neoplastic categories that uh, we discussed. And maybe before you sign off the case, you think about these alternative uh, diagnoses. So with that, I thank you very, very much for your attention. Um, I uh, hope everybody is safe and well, and uh, I look very much forward to seeing you all in person uh, at an actual live meeting uh, in the near future. Thanks.